Winston, whenever you want to go uh, and start, I think we're all uh, ready to proceed. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Louisiana Historical Association presentation on Filipino. Oh, should I? I should probably show myself. Uh, where? Here we go. Is, is, I'll turn on. Oh, okay. There we go. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to the LHA presentation on Filipino and Chinese fishermen of coastal Louisiana. Uh, we've got some. Uh, the three very interesting panelists here today, and we're going to begin with uh, Michael Salgarolo, who uh, just uh, who recently uh, completed his uh, PhD at NYU at uh, NYU at New York University NYU, and you're still there, right? Aren't you? You're still That's there right. as a postdoc. Yeah. All right. And uh, you will be uh, giving a uh, talk a little bit about uh, his uh, dissertation, which was about uh, St. Malo, and uh, uh, uh I, I don't think I have anything else to say. Yeah, I guess you can start now. <laughs> I'm sorry, I've never never been a, a chair of one of these committees before. This is a new experience for me. You're doing great, Winston. Thank you. I was I wanted to start off by saying thanks so much uh for putting this panel to get together. Um, thanks so much for um to uh James and all the and Libby and the folks at the LHA uh for giving us this opportunity. Um I, I recognize a lot of folks who are here. Um, special shout out to uh, uh, Dr. Michio Yamanaka, who I believe is calling in from Japan. Um, so uh, it's great to uh, see folks coming in uh, from, from all over. Um, so I'm gonna talk a little bit today about um, some of the research I've done uh, on uh, St. Malo, uh, Louisiana. Um, and I actually, because this is a, a public panel and we're inviting uh, you know not only scholars and historians, but members of the public, um, I'm actually going to invite folks to uh, participate uh, in this talk a little bit. So uh, I'm going to ask folks to participate in the chat. Um, so so uh, just 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 uh, just hopefully uh, uh, be ready to to kind of engage. Uh, I'd love to to hear from folks. Um, so for those who don't know, Saint Malo was a small fishing village in southern Louisiana that was settled by Filipino sailors in the first half of the 19th century. At its peak, the settlement had roughly 150 inhabitants, mostly Filipino men, uh, but it also included their native-born wives and children. They lived in houses perched on stilts above the water, and their main form of subsistence and commercial activity uh, was fishing and gathering oysters. And although St. Malo was destroyed by a hurricane in 1893, it, remained a pop uh, it remains a topic of popular interest due to its position as one of the first Filipino communities in the United States, and one of the earliest Asian American communities in the United States. So today I want to take a little, uh, uh, a more in-depth look uh, at this early Filipino American history in Louisiana, and I want us to think critically about how we tell this story. So a lot of the popular writing on St. Malo, Louisiana, talks about this story with kind of an American dream type narrative about about lucky immigrants who make hard sacrifices and eventually prosper and become Americans. And I think rather than framing this merely as an immigration story, uh, I wanted to I want us to think about St. Malo uh, as a site that tells us something about uh, American empire and, and global uh, empires and, and the way that they moved um, peoples around the world. In the words of the historian Moon Ho Jung, we, we, uh, we should think about Asian American history not as a story of immigrants aspiring to become Americans, uh, but rather to think about peoples in and from Asia as racialized and radicalized subjects of empire. The Filipinos who settled at St. Malo, Louisiana did not come there because they believed in America's promise of freedom and prosperity. These were Spanish colonial subjects seeking a respite from the brutality and exploitation that they experienced as sailors. They intentionally built their settlement in a remote marshland to evade surveillance and control by mainstream American institutions. In other words, these men took matters into their own hands and created their own notions of freedom. They built their own worlds on the margin of American society, uniting with poor white people and formerly enslaved African Americans. In the swamps, the, the humid, bug-infested swamps of southern Louisiana, they built for themselves a refuge from colonialism. 
And today I want to make the case that St. Malo is an example uh, of collective resistance uh, to Western colonialism. So I want to start us by, by situating us in this particular place, um, St. Malo, Louisiana. Um, and I want us to do this by, by asking folks to, to tap into their, um, their five senses. Um, so we're, we're in the coastal marshes here on a, on a strip of land between uh, Lake Bourne and the Gulf of Mexico. Um, and I want you to, to, to imagine that you are here in the 19th century. You're sitting on one of these docks. You're sitting on one of these boats. Um, and I want you to activate uh, your five senses. Um, so in the Zoom chat, um, I, I want folks to share um, what's something that you can hear if you're if you're sitting out um, on one of these docks at St. Malo? What's something that you might hear? Birds, good, good, right? Lots of birds um, flying through the wetlands. What else might you hear? Frogs, good, good, yeah, a lot of frogs. Water splashing from fish, good, absolutely, absolutely. Mosquitoes buzzing, wind, excellent. Excellent. Good. You can hear all of these things, right, in this in this bayou environment. Um, what's something you might smell? What's something you might smell if you're if you're out on one of these boats or maybe in one of these houses? What's something you might smell? Fishiness. Good. Good. I think I know. I think I know the vibe, right? Good. There's fish. Swampiness. Good. Yeah. A little little. You know. Um, muck, tar, swamp gas. Okay, great, great, great. What's something that you might feel or touch if you're here at, at St. Malo? What's something you might you might feel or, or, or touch if you're... Powis, good, sweat, good, right? Um, humid and, and, and people are working hard. Uh, good. You might feel some scratchy uh, plants, right? Good. We see we see all kinds of different um, 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 plants and 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 reeds here. Um, good. Good bites from bugs. Good. You all right? There's a lot of lot of scratching, right? A lot of scratching yourself. Um, good, right? You might be feeling the water. You might be feeling uh, you might be feeling rain. Absolutely, right? Lots of lots of rain and and and. Uh, um, Right, we we feel that in the environment. This is fantastic. Um, so I, I I do this because I want to remind people that this is not just about um, it's not just about um, you know picking things out of the archives and 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 seeing things from a distance, but to remind us that are, that these historical actors are uh, um, you know three dimensional people who live uh, complicated lives. Um, can can folks hear me all right? Okay, great. Great, um, fantastic. All right, so who were these um, Filipinos who lived at St. Malo? Who, who were these um, sailors and why did they decide to build this ocean, uh, this uh, settlement two oceans away from home? Well, the short answer is this. The Filipino settlement at St. Malo came about as a result of British and American commercial expansion Beginning in uh, 1834, the Spanish colonial government of the Philippines began to end its monopoly on foreign trade, opening its ports to merchants of all nations. The most influential from, were merchants from Great Britain and the United States. Between 1835 and 1844, sugar exports from Manila nearly doubled, driven largely by demand from Great Britain, which began searching for new suppliers after it abolished slavery in its Caribbean colonies. American traders made their presence known as well, driven largely by demand for abaca or manila hemp, a fiber used in, uh, in the manufacture of ropes and cords. This increase in foreign shipping led to an increased demand for native seamen in Philippine ports. Merchants and ship captains frequently recruited and retained Filipino sailors, who were often known as manila men, through coercive means. One Filipino ex-sailor in Louisiana told an interviewer that, quote, it was the custom of the Spaniards to seize natives of the Philippines and the outlying islands, impress them into forced service in the merchant marine, and treat them so cruelly that they would desert in any port of the world. 
in a 2004 oral history, a Filipino descendant in Louisiana told interviewers that when her grandfather was 11 years old, quote, one of his distant uncles came by and his uncle took him on the ship and he showed him everything and put him in chains. He eventually escaped, escaped with two other boys and found his way to St. Malo. While some ship captains resorted to outright kidnapping, others got sailors to work willingly but refused to let them leave, using the threat of physical violence to keep sailors working against their will. Filipino sailors deployed a variety of tactics to resist or challenge these arrangements, ranging from open rebellion to legal appeals. In late 1885, two Filipino sailors, Augusto and Sierra, were working on an American vessel called the Thayer, traveling from Manila to New York. When one of the Filipinos refused to follow orders, the captain, quote, took up a rope's end and gave him a cut or two over the shoulders. Later, the first mate gave one of them a slap with his hand. Soon after, Sierra and Augusto led a mutiny as the ship sailed across the southern Atlantic Ocean. After attacking the ship's officers with knives, they barricaded themselves in the ship's cabin and started a fire, burning the ship at sea. The newspapers depicted the attack as an unprovoked act by, quote, two crazy Manila seamen, but it's fairly easy to see now that this was retaliation for abuse aboard the vessel. The most common tactic, however, was simply to desert when ships came to port. Filipino sailors formed communities in port cities across the Atlantic world, including uh, New York, Philadelphia, Liverpool, and Barcelona. In addition to these urban enclaves, some Filipino sailors built fishing settlements on the outskirts of British colonies, including Australia's Torres Strait and Calc Bay, South Africa, which is outside of Cape Town. Um, and here, outside South Africa, they formed a uh, fishing uh, settlement that, that in many ways resembles that of, uh, of St. Malo, um, but in South Africa. So St. Malo itself, um, this site, again, between Lake Bourne and um, the, the uh, Gulf of Mexico, was uniquely shaped by Louisiana's geography and cultural uh, history. Uh, of course, as, as uh, attendees of the LHA will know, before the arrival of European colonists, the land around modern-day New Orleans was known as Bulbancha, a Choctaw word meaning place of many tongues, and was a place of exchange and encounter uh, between many uh, indigenous nations. Um, uh, you know, the, the French colonial regime, as well as the Spanish colonial regime that, that uh, took over in the, uh, in the 18th century, uh, were built on the labor of enslaved Africans. In the 1780s, a group of enslaved people led by a man named Juan San Malo escaped to the coastal marshes of St. Bernard Parish, where they lived in freedom for several years despite the colonial government's attempts to capture them. The marshes where the San Malo Maroons lived became known as St. Malo, and Juan San Malo would become a revered figure uh, in New Orleans Creole folk culture. The Filipinos who came to St. Malo were attracted by the area's uh, remote location and its abundance of natural resources. Deep in the bayous of St. Bernard Parish, Louisiana, St. Malo was not easily accessible to government authorities. This meant that the Filipino men who settled there were largely able to create an autonomous, self-governing community. Bayou St. Malo's location gave the men of St. Malo easy access to the waters of Lake Bourne and the Gulf of Mexico, both of which were teeming with marine life. Using large nets called sends, they caught uh, redfish and sheep's head for subsistence and to sell to New Orleans merchants. Um, the, the Filipinos of St. Malo uh, chose to abandon the formal labor market and create their own semi-autonomous society, creating a refuge uh, from an ever-expanding world of unfree labor uh, under uh, global mm -hmm. capital. The men kept pigs and chickens to supplement their diet of fish, rice, and beans. Fish was usually smoked, dried, and served with oil and vinegar. Gambling was a common pastime. They, they were um, cockfighting matches. They also played a unique game of chance that combined elements of Chinese-style kino and Mexican-style loteria. Uh, and you can see the men uh, playing this game uh, in, this, uh, in this image here. While most of St. Malo's population was made up of single Filipino men, some Filipino men married and raised children with native-born black and white women forming the first generation of Louisiana's modern-day Filipino descendant communities. Um, it's also a near certainty that some of the men at St. Malo uh, became sexual partners with each other. 
Others that lived at St. Malo were working class men from a variety of national and ethnic backgrounds, including men from France, Ireland, Italy, Mexico, and at least one Brazilian man of African descent. The Filipinos themselves came from all different parts of the islands, and Tagalog and Spanish served as the settlement's common languages. The The Filipinos at St. Malo practiced uh, um, mutual aid and community solidarity, both informally as well as formally. In 1870, a group of Filipinos founded the Sociedad de Beneficencia de los Hispano-Filipinos de Nueva Orleans, a mutual aid society that maintained a group tomb in a New Orleans cemetery. Like many mutual aid societies of the 19th century, they pooled their resources in order to ensure that their members could receive a proper burial. What's important to note as we think about this, this community formation and this, this community coming together is that these men did not leave lives that were defined by loneliness and alienation, as we often think of early um, Asian uh, migrants um, you know, coming to the United States. Um, in a foreign land where they lacked both institutional power and traditional kinship networks, the men of St. Malo built deep-rooted alliances with strangers that allowed them to build rich, fulfilling lives amid the devastation of colonialism. Now, of course, what we have left of St. Malo are, um, you know, fragments in the historical archive and also, um, you know, precious memories that have been, uh, you know, recorded and, and preserved uh, from, from modern descended communities. But of course, as a historian, there's always a limit to what we can definitively know uh, at St. Malo. And that's why I've encouraged us to do what we've done today, which is to use those archival fragments to rebuild and reimagine the world of these historical actors. Um, and so I, 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 I do this history and I try to tell this story uh, with the idea that we can capture some of the brilliance and the ingenuity uh, of those who came before us um, and bring it with us into the 21st century. So um, thank you all again for listening. I'm excited for um, questions and, and, and comments in the end, uh, as well as the other two panelists. Thank you very much. That was very good, Michael. Um, I wanted to point out that uh, the Filipinos of St. Malo were in a really good place because um, when the Filipinos showed up, Spain had um, taken a lot of Spanish citizens from the Canary Islands and put them in St. Bernard Parish. Uh, one of That's one of the parishes that they put them in. So the Filipinos had access to people that they could buy, sell, and trade with who also spoke Spanish. So that was to their advantage too. And also fellow Catholics. So yes, apparently yeah. the Islamists and Filipinos got along really well. Thank you, Michael. And uh, I will be giving the uh, next uh, presentation. And I will be, and my name is, by the way, if I haven't, I, I don't think I introduced myself earlier, but my name is Winston Ho. I'm a public historian at the Historic New Orleans Collection. And I am also an independent historian specializing in modern China and Chinese American history. And uh, let's see. So we're going to talk a little bit about Manila, about Manila Village. So let's uh, let's get oriented here. Uh, New Orleans is here. St. Malo is way over here in St. Bernard Parish. And Manila Village is somewhere over here in uh, Barataria Bay, which is south of the city and quite far. Uh, from St. Malo. And here's a close-up of Barataria Bay, and you can see New Orleans is over here, and Manila Village is on located on these two islands here. Uh, Winston, so you want to half... share, share your screen. Oh, you cannot see. I knew, see, I said I've never done, never quite, uh, yeah, it's like giving the presentation and trying to, uh, uh, trying to be the, uh, try to lead the whole conversation at the same time. Here we go. Okay, can you see it? See it now. Perfect. Thank you. All right. Here we go. Let's try this again. And now I've uh, lost Zoom. Oh, hold on. Share slides. Okay. There we go. So here, yeah. So once again, New Orleans is over here. St. Malo over here in St. Bernard and Barataria Bay and Manila Village to the south, way down here on to the south of the city, right along Louisiana's southeast coast, close of Barataria Bay, New Orleans. And then Manila Village is on these two little islands in in the along the northern rim of Barataria Bay, roughly halfway between the modern city of Lafitte 
and Grand Isle. This is a uh, map that uh, it looks like what happened. This is actually in the conference room at the uh, Department of History at UNO. The, this this and I guess they must have taken like a regular uh, government issue official map of Louisiana and put it on a like a on plywood and, and use a jigsaw to, to cut off this cut this uh, profile of Louisiana. But on this map, uh, you can see that Manila Village is actually on that map. And in fact, Manila Village is on pretty much every official state map of Louisiana throughout the, the whole 20th century up to I think the 1970s is, is when it finally disappeared from official maps. So you can go to almost any state office in in the in louisiana in fact i was at the notario archives and actually saw one of these official state maps and manila village was on it so yeah i mean manila village was a very significant settlement when it existed it, its location was very well known uh, and remains well known to this day even though it doesn't exist anymore at least among local fishermen in fact this is a uh, satellite ma uh, fishing map uh, that 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 you that they sell out in the uh, wherever they sell like fishing tackle for the fishermen. So uh, supposedly it's a, a really place a good place to go crabbing to this day. Except uh, there's a lot of underwater de uh, underwater debris. Uh, so when you pi pilot a boat over there, you might want to want to watch yourself. So we're not actually sure when Manila Village was founded. Uh, it was there by the 1890s. Uh, maybe it was founded a little earlier than that. We're, we're not really sure. Uh, but in any case, we do know that uh, Manila Village was founded by an immigrant from the Philippines named Quentin de la Cruz. In fact, de la Cruz's obituary even says that he was the founder of Manila, Manila Village. And there's this obituary is interesting because there's actually two of them. Uh, the first uh, uh, obituary for de la Cruz said that he was uh, a Spaniard. And his family must have corrected the uh, Heinz Picayune because uh, the very next day they ran a second obituary that says, no, he was uh, from the Philippines and specifically says that he was from Albi. Uh, so that's the only reason why we know that that uh, Quentin de la Cruz was, was from Albi. And uh, de la Cruz, uh, here's a photograph with de la Cruz among these other uh, Filipino-American leaders. And... Uh, Let's see. And uh, unfortunately, we don't have a lot of information about the early, early history of Manila Village. This is also why we're not really sure exactly when it was founded. Uh, much of what we know about the early history of Manila Village actually comes from the census schedules. This is actually a genealogical uh, document. It, it's a book uh, uh, about uh, uh, for uh, the for Barataria Bay and the Terrebonne Parish area, but they also have this uh, these uh, these spreadsheets that were compiled from data in the census schedules, and you can see that uh, Quentin de la Cruz is a uh, he's he's under his a uh, I think middle initial Quentin de, uh, I guess Jacinte uh, de la Cruz. He's right. He's listed here in the census schedules. This is from the 1890 census, and you will also notice that the census incorrectly describes him as being Chinese. So that we know for a fact that the De La Cruz's are not Chinese, definitely Filipinos. That's his wife, Sarah. Uh, so, uh, yeah, so this is a problem the Filipinos always have. This is a problem whenever you're looking for Filipinos in the sources. They're mislabeled as 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 Chinese or Oriental or white or colored or mulatto or Hispanic, which is technically correct. And you notice here that uh, and this is very common among these Filipino American families at this point in history, you see that his uh, uh, wife, Sarah, is also, was born here in Louisiana, in Louisiana and had a uh, apparently a Filipino father and a Louisiana born mother. And then all of their kids were born in Louisiana with a Filipino father. Uh, here we see a, a whole group of uh, Filipino fishermen. You notice that they're listed as being natives of Manila. Uh, rather than native, natives of the Philippines, uh, even though the Philippines, I think, was part of the U.S. by the 1900 census. Again, this is a whole other issue at, that they're uh, being identified by uh, something like Manila men or, or some other or Malay even uh, rather than Filipino. But no, these these people, you look at their names, uh, some of these names we actually recognize. We know these people are Filipinos and, and the same thing. Uh, a lot of the Filipinos are married to local Louisiana born women and uh, their children are, are from Louisiana. And so, yeah. And also we see other immigrant groups are here. Uh, in over here, uh, we see all these uh, Chinese names 
And uh, so, and the way you read this, and this is what you also see in the census schedules, is that the first column is the place of birth of, of this person. And then the second column is the place of birth of the father. And then the third column is place of birth of the mother. Uh, of course, in many cases, when you see the same last name, presumably their their relatives, maybe uh, husband and wife and children. And through that, you can infer that yeah, a lot of these these uh, Filipinos and Chinese were just married to uh, local Louisiana women. Uh, not uh, not always obvious from here uh, what race they are, but uh, definitely uh, sometimes they'll actually list race as being uh, Chinese or something. Uh, but uh, yeah, and uh, and then you have all these kids. So the the pattern that we have among the Chinese American families are very similar to the Filipinos, where they're intermarrying with local women and having these children that are of mixed Chinese and white or African-American or even Native American ancestry. Although we do also see some rather uh, intriguing things, because if you look over here, you see that Mr. Lee Yacht is actually a native of California. His parents are Chinese, but he's from California. And we see other cases of this. Uh, there's a, uh, yeah, I think, uh, Mr. Uh, I think that's Jin Choi Chong, also a, a parents from China, but native of California. If this is accurate, and it's questionable whether these are all accurate, but if they are accurate, then it suggests that not all of the Chinese that were in Barataria Bay were Chinese immigrants. Some of them were actually American-born Chinese that moved here from California. And there was another fishing industry in California. So maybe these were actually fishermen from California and they basically uh, were kicked out of, of California because of the anti-Chinese laws that were there. And then they came to, and these California Chinese fishermen ended up here in Louisiana because they uh, felt that things would be better over here. This is interesting. At the bottom over here, we see uh, Sadate Nino and he is a native of Japan. And this is how you often find the Japanese in these records. They appear either by themselves or maybe in a group of, of two. Uh, I did see one Japanese American family one time. And typically they actually live among the Chinese and the Filipinos. There's no evidence that the Japanese actually formed their own communities the way that the Chinese and Filipinos did. They just sort of mixed in with the other Asians. And then, of course, like I said, if you look at the rest of these, you'll see Italians, uh, and uh, you, you see, I think I saw Irish, lots of Germans are here, uh, in addition to uh, people that have been here for many generations, including Cajuns, including Islenios. Uh So this is, uh, now it can't be easy building a uh, entire town in the middle of Barataria Bay, uh, especially for an immigrant uh, such as Quentin de la Cruz. Uh, apparently he borrowed a great deal of money to build Manila Village, but at some point in the 1900s, definitely by the 1910s, uh, the De La Cruz family lost control of Manila Village. We're not entirely sure how yet, but uh, it's, uh, in any case, uh, all of Manila Village ended up in the hands of the politically connected and wealthy Fisher family. And you see, and from most of the photographs and most of the histories that we have, dates from the time when the Fisher family uh, control Manila Village. And so you look at a lot of these photographs, you see that this is actually a, a processor's warehouse, and you see that it says Fisher Shrimp Company up here. Lots of photographs will say something like Fisher Shrimp Company or Fisher General Store. Uh, the most famous member of the Fisher family was State Senator Jules Fisher, who you see over here among some of the uh, probably Filipino residents. I know it says Chinese up there, but probably uh, incorrectly described as Chinese. They're wearing hats that look like like the, the uh, Filipino Salcado hats. Uh, Jules Fisher was one of Huey P. Long's lieutenant, uh, chief lieutenants in the state legislature. Uh, one of the guys in the, in the legislature that was uh, getting the other uh, rep representatives to fall in line with the with the other Long guys. Here you see a photograph with uh, of Jules Fisher with the with the uh, OK Allen to the right. And uh, yeah, it's uh, his. You see references to him in biographies of Huey P. Long. In fact, Jules Fisher was known as the Shrimp King of Jefferson Parish. And from what I can tell, Jules Fisher actually uh, much of his political power seems to come from the fact that his family controlled the shrimp business in Barataria Bay. Uh, this is a uh, one of the. There are a lot of early articles, especially in the newspapers about Manila Village. But this, I think, is probably the most influential of the early articles. This is uh, Frank Schoenover's uh, article in Harper's Monthly 
Schoenover was a noted illustrator from Delaware. Uh, the story is that he convinced his uh, fiance that it would be great to go on a honeymoon in the uh, the the wetlands of Louisiana and maybe come come up with an article out of it. Uh, this is a very good article. You can find it on Internet Archive. I highly recommend it. It's it's very well written. Talks about Schoenover's journey there, uh, but also Schoenover uh, has these wonderful illustrations uh and you of uh, so you can see here some of the fishermen and they're they're all eating together while they're on break we see a, a, a apparently a filipino woman carrying a child and uh we and so yeah so uh, we also have a uh, photographs some of the uh i think i'm missing a slide here uh but we also have a yeah missing slide uh, i think uh, yeah i don't know what happened to my missing slide but the, i had a slide where he also has some of the earliest illustrations of the uh shrimp drying platform, this vast platform in the middle of Barataria Bay where shrimp was dried in the sun, as well as the so-called shrimp dance uh, that, in fact, you can see this, I think this might be the shrimp dance here, where they're actually walking on the shrimp uh, to crush the shells and, and separate the shells from the meat. Uh, not too long after Schoenover's article is when the Louisiana Conservation Commission went on a tour of Barataria Bay. I think the commission is a predecessor to what is now the Louisiana Department of wildlife and fisheries, and we have a whole bunch of uh, newspaper article, local newspaper articles, uh, such as this one in the New Orleans item that uh, describe their journey there and visiting uh, the the Manila village and seeing some of the Chinese and Filipino fishermen that are out there. Uh, here's another one, and uh, and uh, yeah, and once again, this talks about the uh, the, the great impact that the uh, shrimp drying industry is already having on the state in 1913. Uh, there are quite a few other articles that talk about these early historic articles that, that talk about life in Barataria Bay and in Manila Village. Uh, this one was written by Lyle Saxon for the Jefferson Parish Yearly Review in 1940. Uh, Lyle Saxon would go on to uh, edit the uh, uh, Louisiana State Guide. He had already edited the New Orleans uh, State Guide for WPA by that time. And we see there's actually, a, this is actually a, a woman from the United Homa Nation. He also talks about some of the German res, uh, German residents uh, that have been there since since the colonial era on the West Bank. This is actually Innocencio Jadoria, Richie Jadoria's father. Uh, so uh, one of the Filipino fishermen that lived in Manila Village. Uh, this is the famous, this is, there are a lot of these photographs. All of these photographs I think were take by, taken by uh, Fonville Winans, the famous Louisiana photographer, including lots of these photographs of the so-called oystermen, who we know is Tony Kristicevich, Christ who is actually Italian. And then we uh, see the uh, photographs that we saw earlier of uh, of uh, 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 Jules Fisher. And then we have uh, this photograph. This is a aerial photograph that Fonville Williams took of Manila Village. Uh, and you can see how large that shrimp drying platform was. The entire village was literally built around this drying platform uh, which has been estimated to be maybe at one point in history as large as two football fields in area uh, you can actually see some of the people walking around here and these are this whole settlement is built on stilts uh, you can see the fishing camps back here that uh, the fishermen could rent uh, this is the marina in fact here's a and over here you can see you can see the general, this is where the general store is. And most of the photographs you see of Manila Village are of either the drying platform or of the general store. Uh, and you can see the marina with all the fishing boats back here and all these, again, everything is built on stilts and all of these buildings are basically connected by these elevated walkways. Uh, these two little islands that Manila Village was built on are, are low lying, uh, the flood prone, uh, so here's another one, and I think one of the reasons why there were so many photographs taken from here is is the uh, is the dock up here that usually doesn't get photographed, but people are probably standing on this dock while while the people are standing in the background. And of course, uh, during the shrimp season, the, the this dock is just going to have all. And there are actually, I think, two docks in front of the general store, and uh, all you just have all these fishermen over here on offloading their catch uh, throughout the morning during the shrimp season. Here's a nut. Uh, this uh, another aerial photograph from by Farmville William Winans. Uh, apparently, they were just flying around Manila Village and were able to take it. This photograph from this direction, uh, you can see this. Uh, here's the. Uh, in fact, uh, I talked to uh, Jeffrey Lico, who was who actually was one of the last people to grow up on Manila Village, uh, not too long before he passed away. 
uh, wasn't able to record an interview with him, but he said that at one point, uh, the two islands were actually connected with a bridge. You can see how the, these two islands are right next to each other. He also said there used to be houses, uh, fishing camps on the other island. There used to be a lot more fishing camps back here. And you can see this walkway, which seems to support the idea that there used to be more housing back here. He also said that the plat that there used to be more land, that apparently a hurricane uh, destroyed some of the land uh, up, up here. And that's one reason why the uh, this, this uh, platform ended up being smaller. Uh, here's a, a photo, another photograph of the uh, shrimp dance uh, on the uh, platform at Manila Village. Uh, this photograph gives you a sense for how large this platform really is. And you can see that this platform is almost completely covered with dry shrimp, which was, uh, again, pretty normal during the shrimp season. Uh, here's another photograph of the shrimp dance from uh, from the historic New Orleans collection. And you can see that they're dancing in a circle. Uh, sometimes they're dancing to music, uh, either recorded music, guitar music. Uh, the descriptions tell us that they used all kinds of music, ranging from like music that people would listen to in the Philippines or music they would listen to in China, maybe local popular music. I don't know. Maybe they play Cajun music. And you see that it's off screen, but sometimes there's uh, usually there's a guy with a broom either outside the circle or inside the circle uh, pushing the uh, shrimp into the pile. Now, this is actually one of the last newspaper articles from Manila Village before it was destroyed. And Manila Village was destroyed by uh, Hurricane uh, Betsy in 1965. This article is from 1954. And this article is really interesting because what happened is that uh, uh, Jules Fisher passed away in 1943. And the next year, uh, the Fisher family sold Manila Village to two Chinese, to a group of Chinese investors. Uh, the two managing investors were Xin Ping and CB, CB Wing, and uh, this article very specifically gives us some, some gives us their names and tells us some a little bit of information about when they purchased it and a little bit about the history of Manila Village as Ping and Wing knew about it. Uh, here is once again the uh, processor's warehouse. We have a couple of other photographs like this, and you see that the Fisher name is gone. It now says Ping and Wing. And when you and remember, 1965 is not that long ago. Uh, what was going on is that local fishermen would sell their uh, fresh shrimp to the processors here, whether it was under Quentin de la Cruz or Jewish Fisher or Ping and Wing, and they would dry the shrimp here, and the shrimp would then be uh, packed into barrels and shipped off to warehouses in Homa and in New Orleans. And you often in these old timers, the guys in their 70s, when they were in their youth back in the 50s and 60s, uh, they talk about how they used to sell their cash to uh, these two Chinese gentlemen, Ping and Wing, over at Manila Village. In addition to all of the uh, written records, we also have quite a few uh, uh, oral histories and some of these written accounts by uh, people who used to live in Manila vi Village, uh, which uh, and you can see one of them here is Abraham Canupo who was born in Myrtle Grove, but uh, spent much of his childhood over at Manila, Manila Village with his father. And his father, Hans Knupo, was an immigrant from Germany, a uh, native of Stetton. And so it gives you some idea of how diverse. Uh, it is true that most of the people who lived at Manila Village were Filipino, but again, people of many other backgrounds, Native American, European immigrants, Cajun, Isleno, uh, probably Croatians and Italians. Uh, here we have another uh, uh, article uh, in the Times Picayune where they interviewed Simonio Crepel, another uh, former resident of Manila Village. In fact, this article she talks about how they actually use this uh, special type of boot called brogans uh, to dance the shrimp, and th that was the and she didn't have shoes when she was a kid growing up. The, the first shoes that she was given was the was the brogans that they that she used to, to help out with the shrimp dance. Uh, Crepel was probably of Cajun ancestry. We we see quite a few. Crepels in the census schedules, and I don't know how many Crepels are out there uh, now. Uh, also, this is another article where they were interviewing a Filipino gentleman named William Piquinto, who was actually from the French Quarter. Uh, but it, when he was a teenager, he used to take the train down to Plaquemines Parish and then ultimately the ferry to Manila Village. And he worked at Manila Village every summer. So this is an example of how uh, Manila Village actually had a very seasonal population. Much of the population would actually leave uh, uh, during the winter when when there wasn't shrimping going on and they would end up in places like the French Quarter or the Marigny. There are no schools or hospitals uh, or churches in Manila Village. So people 
uh, would go out uh, would uh, go to the cities for that. Uh, this also uh, this article also uh, has a litany over here. Uh, Manila Village, Basa Basa, and in uh, quite a few articles, it will just give you these litanies of, of places other than Manila Village, like Cabanash, Bayou Defont, Camp Dewey, Clarksville, Bayou Brillo, Bayou Rigo, the Alambro Canal. So, and these are all fishing villages around Barataria Bay surrounding Manila Village. So it wasn't just Manila Village out there. There were quite a few of them. Uh, this is the WPA Louisiana State Guide from 1941. You see, it has a very lengthy description of what Filipino, uh, what a Manila village was like, uh, including how it says down here how the population fluctuates considerably, averaging 250 at the height of the shrimp season, but drops to a handful during the winter months. Uh, but you see that it goes on and it lists once again these other fishing villages, including Bayou Cholas, which is described as having. Uh, a mixed population. Also, I think, uh, let's see, uh, Bayou, let's see, we've got a Bayou Brillo, Bayou Rigo. Uh, here's Leon Rojas, which is probably Clarksville. And then we have Bayou de Fond. And we see that Bayou de Fond is a platform owned by the Kwansung Company, a firm of con uh, composed of Cantonese. This is the oldest of the platform villages, having been here for 80 years by 1941, and most of the workers are Chinese. So Manila Village is here, and Bayou de Fond is over here to the south. And we have this article from the Louisiana Conservationist in 1973. And this is probably the uh, the best version of and of the history of Kwangsung. This article tells us that Kwangsung was founded in 1873 by a man named Li Yuan, and later his son Li Yat took over the company. And uh, and basically, the company was founded in nineteen in seventeen eighty three. Uh, wait, wait, no, it's eighteen. Getting my numbers mixed up. Uh, eighteen seventy three, and uh, probably this is probably the very first platform village in Barataria Bay. Of course, Saint Malo would have existed by a couple of decades by eighteen seventy three, and uh, we have quite a bit of corroborating evidence uh, supporting this story. In fact, uh. Uh, both Li Yat and Li Yat is actually mentioned in this article. It, it, uh, they visited Bayou de Fond, uh during the uh, when the uh, uh, the conservation commission went out there, uh, and so in fact there are a couple of other articles where Li Yat is interviewed. In fact, these photographs are probably photographs from Bayou de Fond rather than Manila Village. Uh, this is also a photograph uh, from the historic New Orleans collection labeled as Kwang Sun Platform, almost certainly Bayou de Fond. Uh, and uh, uh, Kwang Sun Company actually uh, changes its name to Gulf Fruit Products after the Second World War and still exists to this day. So it so this is uh, Kwang Sun or Gulf Fruit Products. This is quite possibly the earliest Chinese American uh, owned business in New Orleans, maybe one of the earliest Asian American owned businesses in the American South. Uh, here's another platform over here. Uh, this is a uh, this is Clarksville, also known as Shenyer Clark, although on this map it's listed as Leon Rojas. And once again, we're not really sure exactly when uh, Clarksville was founded, but we do know that it was founded by another immigrant from the Philippines named John Rojas. And unlike uh, Manila Village, uh, which the Filipinos eventually lost control of Manila Village and was run by the Chinese for actually 20 years, uh, Clarksville remained under Filipino ownership throughout its entire history. And uh, here's uh, the obituary for uh, for John Rojas. After John Rojas uh, passed away, his son Leon Rojas uh, took over the uh, took over control of the platform. And we're not entirely sure how exactly what happened to Clarksville, but we do know it was still there in the 1920s and 1930s and ultimately became, in addition to being, a uh, center for shrimp drying, also a, a major center for fur trading, uh, uh, for uh, fur trapping. Here, this is probably uh, one of the, the earliest photograph of Clarksville. Uh, you see that it dates from 1894, so presumably it was founded right after Manila Village was. Here's a, uh, another photograph of Clarksville from the uh, State Library of Louisiana. Notice this ramp over here next to the processor's shed. This ramp is probably either a, a dry dock and they would pull boats, fishing boats up there to repair them, or maybe it's uh, something used to drag like like uh, lumber or something 
uh, up there so that so that they can uh, uh, do repairs. And uh, we also have I'm having trouble getting this thing. All right. I don't think I can show it because. Uh, hold on a second. Uh, I don't think I'm going to be able to show this, but uh, we have a video. Yeah, I'm having trouble loading this, but we have a video. Here we go. All right. This is a video from the Historic New Orleans collection, a color video from, I think, about maybe late 1930s. And this is another platform village. Uh, this is uh, apparently the only one of the few uh, we do. There are actually other places where you can find actual moving videos of a platform village. Uh, but, yeah, you can see. And I think this is probably uh, this is. Uh, very likely Clarksville. And you can see the processor shed over here. You can see the ramp that I was talking about. In fact, if you look in the background, you can see there's actually another fishing village back there in the distance. Uh, and you can see what's happening here is all these fishing boats are, uh, are crowded along the uh, dock here to, to sell their cash to the processor over there. Uh, this is probably late morning. And uh, yeah, not a, not a very long video, but still uh, you can see all the baskets with the fresh shrimp in them. So let's see, moving on. Yeah, here's another shot. Uh, they were actually going on a fishing expedition to Grand Isle, and they were they started out in Lafitte and went down the Barataria, uh, Barataria Waterway along the Barataria Bay. You see how open it is out there in the bay. Okay, let's see. Let me go back here. And uh, let's see. moving on, another... Village is actually Camp Dewey over here next in it's in Plaquemines Parish next to the Wilkinson Canal. And this is the only this is I don't know if Ronda Rishu has any more of them, but this is the only known known photograph of Camp Dewey. And uh, the interesting thing about Camp Dewey, once again, we're not really sure when it was founded, uh, but we do know it was found by the uh, another wealthy and politically influential family in Plaquemines Parish, the, the Wilkinsons. And uh, and ultimately, the the Wilkinson family sold uh, Camp Dewey to Herman Fernese, who is uh, one of one of Ronda Rishu's uh, uncles, I think, great uncle. And uh, so, uh, yeah, so it ended up being another Filipino uh, owned fishing village. And then we have Cabanash, or, which is to the immediate south of Manila Village. And here's that photograph again by Fonville Winans of Manila Village. But if you look in the background over here, you will notice these uh, cabins over here lined up along this coast of this other island. And that's Cabanash. Uh, this is actually one of the only this is, I think, the only photograph that we have of Cabanash, uh, best known for uh, uh, for the Jadoria family, ultimately buying a, uh, for a living there, renting a fishing camps out there. So Richie Jadoria uh, uh, was the daughter of Innocencio Jadoria, actually grew up over there in Cabanash. And also Cabanash uh, appears in. Uh, here on um, this is again another photo. This is a close up of that photograph we saw earlier of the Manila Village General Store, which was also a post office. And you can see here that it actually says uh, post office, it's the Cabanash post office. So again, Cabanash and Manila Village were right next to each other, and so they just uh, apparently shared the same post office. In fact, the truth is that I think uh, this general store and this post office served as the post office for all of these. Uh, these fishing villages along Barataria Bay. They're almost like all of these other fishing villages are basically basically smaller versions of Manila Village. So they're almost like sort of like suburban communities and Manila Village is your downtown. Uh, one more thing I want document I want to look at is this uh, Mississippi Delta Ethnographic uh, Overview, which was commissioned by the National Park Service in 1979, uh, the year after the, uh, the John Lafitte National Park was founded. And you see that this is actually a survey of all the diverse groups of people that lived out there in Barataria Bay, including uh, including Syrians and Lebanese, some of the early Arabs, including Jewish people, including Greeks. And then he uh, over here uh, we have this uh, we have a uh, Michael Caron who wrote three chapters on uh, just the Filipinos, Chinese, and the Vietnamese fishermen. And of course, the Vietnamese had just arrived in Barataria Bay. In 1979, and that's around, and this is a uh, about 14. This is a uh, about what is it? Uh, a couple of years after the destruction of Manila Village, and so the Chinese and the Philippine Filipinos are actually leaving Barataria Bay around the time that the Filipinos, are around the time that the Vietnamese are arriving. But the most interesting thing of all in this document is this map, uh, which actually lists 
all of the uh, villages that we talked about earlier, and also uses this title, Asian Coast of Barataria Bay. Uh, uh, Ronda Rishu has never heard that term used before, so I don't think the Filipinos were using it. Uh, I don't think the Chinese were using it either. So I think uh, Michael Caron actually just uh, coined the name Asian Coast of Louisiana, but I, you know, it's like it's like German Coast. It's like you have all these German coasts, all these communities lined up along the Mississippi River, and you have all these uh, Chinese and Filipino fishing villages lined up along the Barataria Waterway. So uh, I like the name Asian Coast. It works well. Yeah, and one more, th and before we are close, I'm going to say that uh, Saint Malo often gets confused with Manila Village and also uh, by Dufan, they often get conflated with each other. In fact, I even uh, had to correct the Historic New Orleans collection one time. Uh, they, they said that like uh, Manila Village well, was founded by the Chinese uh, uh, in late Spanish colonial rule. And yeah, that, that's taking the stories of uh, St. Malo and Bayou Dufan and Manila Village and, and crushing them all together. So anyway. Yeah, I seem to have gone way over time. Like I said before, this is the first time I'm doing this. It's really hard to give a presentation and keep an eye on time at the same, at, keep an eye on, on the clock. But we're going to move on to uh, Randy Gonzalez now and uh, from the universe, uh, University of Louisiana at Lafayette and also from the Philippine Louisiana Historical Society. And he's going to talk to us about the uh, historics, about the markers and preserving the memory of, of these, uh, his, of these uh, historic uh, fishing villages that don't exist anymore. Thanks, Winston. Um, I need to share my screen now. So let's see. see, could you remove yours? Yeah. Uh -huh. You'll need to click stop share at the bottom, Winston. Okay. I'm still seeing. We, we see you now, Randy, if you want to share your screen. Okay. Yeah. Into my screen. Oh. Somehow lost my screen. Sorry. Let me try that again. On my desktop. I mean. All right, we can see your desktop. Oh, here we go. Here we go. Okay. Thanks. Okay, so I'm going to talk about memory, community, and climate change, uh, the reception of St. Malo in the Manila Village historical markers. So I'm talking about recent history. And so I want to give a brief history of how the markers were set up and then go on into kind of explaining or looking at how they were received by an audience. And that means like how did an audience come to understand them? So... The story starts, or I'm going to start at, at, in 2019 at the unveiling of the St. Malo marker at the Islanos Museum Complex. And in that, in the unveiling, Ruth Lim Juco spoke about her goal of erecting historical markers when she was assigned to the Philippine Council General of New Orleans in 1977. She said, people didn't know Filipinos had been here for a long time. So I thought when I was assigned here, I want to undertake a project to make it known that we've been here a long time. And I'm so glad we now have markers first in Lafitte and now St. Bernard. Now, Lemjuko reiterated this in 1982 in, when, in, um, when she visited St. Manila Village. The marker was erected in 2012. This is 30 years after Lemjuko said that she wanted to kind of have this marker. So it took 30 years to get the first marker from Manila Village up. The, um, so the Philippines Honorary Council Robert Romero founded the Philippine Louisiana Historical Society. Now this society was designed basically to erect these markers. The Historical Society drew from the resources and resourcefulness of the Filipino community to kind of complete the marker projects. 
Romero developed the political connections to secure a site for the Manila Village marker. He approached Lafitte Mayor Tim Kerner Sr. about erecting a marker in the town of Lafitte. Um, Tim Kerner Sr. is married to a, a descendant of early Filipino settlers, Juan Rojas. Um, so they were able to secure a location in front of the Lafitte Town Hall. Um, Dr. Carmelo Ostelia wrote the marker text, and the members of the society kind of helped organize and plan the events. The, the marker went up in 2012 as part of a Philippine Independence Day ce celebration. Now, I joined the Historical Society in 2016. The following year, we started planning for the St. Malo historical marker. As with the first marker, Council Romero worked with local government officials to secure a site, and that's the Islanos Museum Complex, and I took over the research and writing duties from Dr. Estilla. We unveiled the marker in November of 2019. So now it's five years after the unveiling, and I'm starting to take stock of how the marker and the story it represents is being, has been received by the public. So I'm going to talk about a little bit of media reception and audience reception. This is my English background. I'm an English professor. Um, and so in this presentation, I want to explain how these different audiences received the marker. So I look at the marker, the speeches, the talks, and all of this as, as a communicative act, as a communicative act. And this act goes out to an audience, right? But it's it can be kind of intercepted or interpreted by the media, which then distributes it to an audience. So how we understand information is not always direct, but might go through different circles or might be passed on by some other intermediary. Um, so I'm going to talk about how this kind of has worked or how I understand how it's worked with the, the reception of the marker. And I'll focus on three um, audience groups and then how they receive the marker and briefly discuss how the marker impacts, you know, on public memory. And mem public memory is how the public understands history and thinks about things and connections to the past. So first, a little bit about markers. Um, the medium of a historical marker has a singular, has a purpose and that purpose has generally been tourism. The Louisiana State Historical Marker Program is managed by the Louisiana Tourism Development Commission. This link to tourism, you know, hawks back to the early days of U.S. state marker programs that marketed history available on state highways. The audience for these markers were anyone traveling down these highways. The Manila Village and St. Malo markers are not located in spaces where one simply happens upon. Yet tourists still kind of make their way to these remote, relatively remote locations. Bill Highland, director of Los Islanos Museum Complex, reported that over the last two years, an average of 75 visitors a month take a trip to the St. Malo marker. Most of these visitors had ties to the Filipino community, and some of them have come as, as groups organized by, by Filipino American community organizers. So the marker has worked as a tourist attraction, particularly the St. Malo marker to draw people to the site. And now next I wanna talk about community memory. So community memory is how does the community, how does the marker kind of enhance or help the community think about their history? Uh, so in the press release for the, the unveiling of the historical marker, you know, I uh, I was quoted as saying that, that I thought the marker was there to inform the public about our history. I was addressing this desire for St. Malo and Manila Village to enter into public memory, a call that an acknowledges that the story of Filipino communities have been marginalized and forgotten by most. For Filipinos in Louisiana, the markers serve as a reminder of the story our ancestors knew. So I'm going to talk about Rhonda, our, our panelist here, or our commenter. A day after the unveiling of the St. Malo marker, Rhonda tagged family members in a Facebook post in which she described the importance of the marker in the conversation about American history. 
Grisha's family was honored in the unveiling ceremony, an honor she attributed to the family's always remembering who we are. In other words, for keeping the family history and the history of the Filipino community in memory. Risho contributes to the public memory of Filipino Louisiana by sharing her family story widely, including through Filipino Americans in Louisiana, a Facebook book community with over 1,600 followers. The stories Rishu tells of her Filipino family support the public memory of this long history of Filipinos in Louisiana. Rishu closed her post to her family with an acknowledgement of how fragile this memory can be, especially when competing with dominant narratives that exclude Filipinos from the story of Louisiana. She wrote, please don't forget, teach your children. So, Getting back to the historical markers now, so that was one concept of reception, right? Rhonda received it and, and, and interpreted it within the community and, and thought about how the, the community should react to the markers and keep it in memory, right? Keep this history in memory. Um, but historical markers make clear that there's a role for government in highlighting histories that benefit them. To erect an official state marker, you need the approval of the Louisiana Tourism Development Commission. To secure a public space to place the marker, you need to convince politicians of the value of the marker to the community. Although the marker states that it was created, the St. Malo marker states that it was created by the Philippine Louisiana Historical Society, the photograph of the unveiling reveals the truth that it's difficult for history to be featured in public spaces without being vetted and sponsored by political institutions. The, photos, the photo doesn't highlight community. It features the representatives of the Philippine consulate and St. Bernard Parish politicians. Now for segments of the general public, this government stamp of approval validates the history being presented in the markers. The presence of political figures suggests that, they, that the political figures see the value of the marker and want to be associated with it. This validation is important in the work the marker does as counter memory. Now, counter memory is the is the memories that counter what the normal the history that you've kind of known before. The memories you you've had of a place that were given to you through school, through your education, through experience. Um, so Risho and her family didn't need the marker to tell them the value of the Fili of Filipino heritage. This was a given. This is a given for Rhonda, and she and her family has long held the story of Filipinos in Louisiana close and shared it widely. But others in the community needed this reminder of the value of Filipino of the Filipino community to Louisiana. In the Jim Crow South, Filipinos found it expedient to deny a heritage that marked them as non-white prominently placed historical markers that celebrated Filipino presence, presence sorry, in the region suggest that they should be proud of the heritage. So white presenting men and women came up to me after, at the marker events to tell me, hey, I'm Filipino too. So the reception here is this kind of openness and awareness that it's okay to be Filipino. We have this validation in the community. Now, not every Filipino American in Louisiana needed this validation of the marker, but some came out to say that, you know, we're more proud now to be Filipino. And so this is one of the ways that the marker has kind of brought the community together or brought more Filipinos out to identify with their heritage and the history. Um, so this is, a, is an act of kind of counter memory. And this memory is against the exclusion of Filipinos from the dominant narrative of Louisiana. And this narrative tends to emphasize Louisiana's European heritage. So to those who don't know this, about the story of Filipinos in Louisiana, they're introduced to it by the marker. To those who know the story, the, the, the marker kind of verifies the significance of their memories. Now, I stress counter, me counter memory when I said for the press release that I wanted the stories of St. Malo and Manila Village integrated into the Louisiana story everyone knows. In St. Bernard Parish, the story everyone knows is that Islano, the Islanos settled the area. 
The Islanos Heritage Society keeps Islanos heritage in the public memory of parish residents. The placement of the St. Malo marker in the Islanos Museum complex served to interject Filipino American and Asian American history into the memory of the local community. Bill Highland spoke to this counter memory when he said, to understand the history of St. Bernard Parish, you have to know about the Filipinos that first settled here. They are part of our cultural identity. In that statement, he's basically acknowledging that people in the, haven't re readily known this information, right? And this memory is now coming, this, this history is now being placed into the regular memory of parish residents. Highland indicated that the history of St. Malo was a counter memory to the memory many St. Bernard Parish residents have of their history. Now there was some pushback to this counter memory from the community, but the marker and the stories residents tell of Filipino ancestors continue to counter this dominant public narrative of Lower St. Bernard Parish as simply an Islano space. Oh, there's my counter memory slide. <laughs> so next, I want to talk about Filipino American memory because the story of Saint Malo, uh, in particular, is has been widely known, right? In particularly in the Filipino American community. So Filipino Americans who come from outside of the state to visit the marker are, are often aware of the story. And the story that's widely circulated in the community. Marina Espina first reported her research on St. Malo at the 1982 Filipino American National Historical Society meeting. She published the account in 1988 in Filipinos in Louisiana. Espina claimed that St. Malo was established before the U.S. was a nation. The claim that Filipinos had settled in the territory that would become the U.S. prior to the American Revolution kind of stoked the imagination of Filipino Americans and led to her account being reported widely. The historical marker creates a space that can be associated with that memory. Visiting the, the site of the marker serves to further validate the memory by creating experience to associate with the history. The fact that the text of the marker counters the dates in Filipino American public memory seems not to be above big concern. The text of the marker dates the settlement early in the first half of the 19th century, countering the unverified claim of 1763. Some visitors ask about this discrepancy, but the counter narrative doesn't invalidate the experience. And for many doesn't even change their minds about St. Malo being settled in 1763. It'll take more than 66 words on a historical marker to change a narrative that's been shared for over 30 years. So memory works, the public memory kind of works in a way that the experiences and the sharing kind of create an idea of history that is very difficult to change once it's kind of embedded and, uh, and takes kind of a constant repetition. And so, the things like this talk kind of add to that, add, adding the story into kind of public memory. Either way, as Lemjuko hoped, the markers make it known that Filipinos have been here for a long time. Now, the media reception to the to uh, to the markers was was quite interesting. The media is important in kind of seeding public memory, right? The media spreads history and allows people to kind of change their perspectives or change their worldview about whether the dominant stories are. The unveiling of the St. Malo marker was covered mainly by national Filipino American or Asian American media outlets. ABS-CBN, a US subsidiary of a Philippine news channel had a camera crew and reporter at the unveiling. Coverage of the event aired on their news channel and, on, and was shared on YouTube. Asian American media covered the unveiling with stories based largely on the press release that was that was sent out, but they did cover it. The mainstream national media media didn't initially cover the story. So how do we, you know, what do we make of this disparity in coverage? Right, one group is really, uh, you know, welcoming this news of the unveiling of this market, and another group is just kind of not paying attention at all. So media studies scholar James Carey explains that there's a ritual view of communication that mass media reflects the worldview of its audience. Carey describes consuming mainstream media 
as a ritual act in which narratives are made to conform to an audience's cultural expectations, which helps them construct an ordered, meaningful cultural world. Now, with this ritual view of communication in mind, it's easy to see the story of St. Malo as aligning with an Asian American worldview. Asian Americans read the article about St. Malo, and this article confirms, yes, we've been here a long time. This counters the worldview of a mainstream media audience willing to accept the stereotype of Asian Americans as perpetual foreigners. Now, COVID may have delayed media coverage some, so, but the first feature article on the unveiling didn't appear until 2021. So that's two years after the unveiling. With the publication of Remembering America's First Filipino Settlement Before It Vanishes Into the Sea by Yasmin Dayag in the Huff Post. Now, this article drew attention back to the marker and inspired a string of media requests and articles. Once one major national publication featured St. Malo, others followed. So it's worth noting that when one national media story, you know, it's just the way it goes. But what I, what I would also notice was that it's usually an Asian American who led the lead in pitching the story to these national media groups and they, usually an Asian American reporter. One interesting thing that came out of this whole process was this chain of reception. Louisiana is often the subject of national stories on climate change. The public memory of Hurricane Katrina and a string of storms since kind of remained top of mind when discussing weather events in Louisiana. Although the Huff piece didn't tie the destruction of St. Malo to climate change, accounts that followed attempted to make that connection. Charles Martindale asserts that our interpretation of a text is kind of constructed by this chain of receptions that can move one text beyond an original meaning. So when one story is written, other reporters read it, but then they start to transform it, right, and move it away from where its intentions. The unveiling of the, the marker and the Huff Post article were read against countless stories of Louisiana storms and land loss. To elevate the story of Filipino American history in Louisiana to national news, the media highlighted what they thought its audience knew about Louisiana, storms, land loss, climate change. Solo Dad O'Brien begins her introduction to the story of St. Malo by saying, climate change is affecting the nation's coastal areas. The episode opens with images of storms and then goes to an interview with me. Climate change is not addressed again in the clip. The lead about climate change was pure clickbait. I guess they believe they couldn't lead with Louisiana is home to the first permanent Filipino settlement in the United States as the Asian American publications did. That would draw the audience, they could draw their audience in, in the national media with storms that were that the audience was familiar with. And they could then lead, go into telling the story about Asian Americans. So although the, 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 the story of uh, St. Malo is, has were brought into national news, this coverage is often kind of conflated with other stories of Louisiana, particularly storm stories. Thank you very much. All right, all right. Thank you, Dr. Gonzalez. And yeah, I mean, all four of us were actually present uh, at the unveiling of the uh, St. Malo marker in 2019. And that was very interesting seeing people who had been wow. like neighbors who, for and known each other their whole lives and and they're like hey you're Filipino too and I'm Filipino so yeah I was just gonna make a comment about that I was so surprised because I worked in the school system so I know everybody in St. Bernard Parish and people that I thought were just Isleño uh, of the Isleños heritage they were at the unveiling and I looked at them and I said what are you doing here and they said well one of my ancestors is Filipino so I was really surprised that they acknowledge that they had Filipino ancestry and they came out to celebrate with us that, that it just really made me happy to see yeah. them there yeah and I, I talked because uh the this it's uh the we had like a, a 
a dinner sort of thing at their, I guess it's like a con meeting hall or convention hall. And the library is next door. And I talked to some of the librarians and they're like, yeah, I mean, we're going to start talking about this with all the kids. We're, we're... So, yeah, I mean, if people in St. Bernard are not really uh, proud. Uh, so, uh, you know, and same thing with the uh, same, same thing with the uh, uh, in the uh, in Lafitte. So and of course, their ma current mayor is actually a uh, part. Uh, Tim Kern Jr. is, of course, a descendant of Filipino fishermen. Anywho, uh, finally, we're going to end with some uh, com comments by Rhonda Rishu, who is a descendant of Philippe Mondriaga, one of the earliest, uh, prob probably the earliest known Filipino-American immigrants. So Rhonda is a member of one of the earliest Filipino-American uh, and one of the oldest Asian-American families in the country. Also, uh, uh, aside from the fact that Rhonda has been interviewed many times about this history, so was her mother, uh, so was her aunt. Uh, so yeah, so this this one family has been responsible for, for and I think this goes back one more generation back. So I mean, th this one family has been promoting Filipino history of Louisiana for for decades now at this point. But yeah, go ahead. Hi, um, and I want to say hello to my brother Tony Rishu. He's up there. He's up up in Oregon, and he he's joined us too. But um, I, I just wanted to make a few comments. The um, platform at Manila Village was like the main, the biggest platform, but my family, a lot of them um, stayed at Camp Dewey because my uncle Hermenes Fernes um, owned Camp Dewey. He bought it from James Wilkinson. But um, if you look, if you're if you're trying to trace your Filipino roots, it's really difficult because those that the people that did the census, um, they wrote the names down. Um, phonetically. So Herman, Hermenes uh, Fernes is the way he pronounces um, Hermenes Pernes. So it comes up with a P-E-R-N-E-S. So that's one thing that y'all have to watch for if you're trying to trace your heritage. The other thing I wanted to say was I interviewed um, a man named Frank Campo who has a boat launch in Shell Beach um, for a different story, an unrelated story. And after I finished the interview, because I, I used to have a column in the Times Picayune, after I finished the interview, I said, have you ever heard of the Filipinos that lived at St. Malo? And he said, well, of course I have. We all have. Uh, he said, my grandfather used to have a lot of pictures of the Filipinos that lived at St. Malo. And um, I asked him if he still had those pictures. He said he would have to go and look in his uh, father's attic to see if they were still available or could, if whether Katrina ruined them. Apparently Katrina ruined them because he never called me. He said he would call me if he found them. But he said that um, the Filipinos had been there as long as the Islanos had. And the Islanos um, were brought to St. Bernard Parish, I think in the 1790s. I just wish that there was some kind of documentation. But you, as you know, the Filipinos they wanted the anonymity. They did not want to be found. They had a good life. They were able to make a living um, fishing in that obscure area of St. Bernard Parish. So the, there's really no written histories from the people that first inhabited it. There's no um, documentation that they've been there since the 1790s. But um, I think that even though there's there's no written documentation, it's very possible that, that that's true because a lot of the Filipinos that were made to work the Spanish galleon ships, a lot of them left and just went into Mexico, went into, you know, migrated up through Texas and Louisiana and ended up in Louisiana. So, you know, there, there's a lot of history there that's unwritten and all we have are um, our family stories. And our family, my um, first ancestor, Felipe Madriaga, he, um, my great grandmother said that her, her grandpa told her that um, when he got to St. Malo in around 1846 to 1849, somewhere in that area, um, he was told that the Filipinos had been there for about 50 years. So again, I really think that it is feasible that we have been here since the 1790s. But um, the thing I try to get across to Philippine, the new Filipino immigrants who come here wanting to hear our history, 
Uh, I tell them you belong here as, as much as the Italians and the Irish and the English do, because we've been here for a very long time. Uh, we make up the the threads of the fabric that is America. And I'm glad that finally uh, people are being interested. I get phone calls all the time from professors asking permission to use my research in their um, Asian studies classes. And that really tickles me because it's Filipino history that's being taught to these college students all over the country. And I, I love that. Anytime somebody calls and asks if they can interview me, of course I say yes, because that means that there's more people who are going to hear about our history. And I really want everybody to understand that we belong here and a Filipino history is a part of American history, just as much as anybody else's history. So it, it's those markers, I think, really help to remind us of that. And I'm glad they finally did it because I think it's like 20 years ago when I first met Mr. Romero, Romero, maybe 15, when I first met Mr. Romero. And it's taken that long for them to get this done, to get that marker put up. And I'm so happy that they finally did because I, I think it's very important. I really enjoyed everybody's presentations. And Winston, you were right. You did surprise me. You found some stuff that I'd never seen before. So thank you for that. I appreciate everything you do for the Filipino Americans in Louisiana um, page on Facebook. Um, the, the stuff that you do really educates people. You've educated me too. So I thank you so much for that. No, thank you very much for the, for for creating the page and everything you've been doing. Yeah, I mean, uh, Rhonda Rishu has actually written articles about about her community uh, for the Times Picayune, and uh, yeah, it's uh, there was a ruthless Junko who was one of Rhonda, R R Robert Romero's predecessors, and one of the reasons why uh, Manila Village is so well known is because she, as the general counsel, had been taking people out to the ruins of Manila Village in the 1980s. And she was already talking about how, you know, we really ought to have a historic marker. So pe people have been literally talking about that for decades. So very exciting when we finally got the markers for both Manila Village and St. Malo. And one of these days we're going to get one for the New Orleans Chinatown. But anyway, I guess we can open up to uh, questions now. Uh, let's see. Just if you have any questions, please put them in the text in the chat. Let's see. I think we had a question. I guess this one is a. Uh, I guess uh, if if Randy can answer this one, where where are Filipino specific media outlet outlets in this landscape? Oh, I don't know. In if you mean in this landscape, Louisiana, I don't know of yeah. any. So I mean, you know, New York up by Michael, the Phil M <laughs> magazine. Yeah. And, you know, there's yeah. A few. I was asking that question too because what it is is that I've actually been trying to look like figure out because LSU actually has a collection of, of newspapers and uh, they do actually have a Chinese language newspaper over there uh, because Tina Sung from UNO was actually one of the editors. But yeah, I was trying to figure out if other Asian American communities because I know there are Vietnamese language newspapers. I don't know if the other Asian communities have them and whether LSU was archiving them and they're not. Uh, the only Asian American newspaper that's being archived at, at LSU is this one Chinese language newspaper from the 90s because a UNO librarian was one of the uh, was one of the editors. Uh, so moving on, uh, can anyone comment on uh, Jessam Ward's mother swamp and recent efforts for cross-cultural solidarity and ethnic studies history in the current academic landscape? Michael, are you familiar with this this with this work? Because I've never heard of it. Uh, I'm not Okay. I mean, I've heard about it from uh, from Carolyn, who who just asked the question. So oh, I have right. not I have not read that. Um, yeah, read that book. Uh, I will say that you know one thing that's been encouraging is is there have been, you know, increasing efforts across the country in different places to implement Asian Pacific American history in different states. Um, and so I was um, very privileged to contribute a piece on Saint Malo to the um, to you know New York's new Asian American uh, history, social studies curriculum. Um, and so, um, you know, kids in New York City public schools are, are are learning about this history as part of their social studies education, um, which which I'm I'm really happy about. Yeah, I've been working on bibliographies. I've, I've, I'm working hard on a bibliography on Vietnamese American history because we've got 
a uh, it's because the 50th anniversary of the fall of Saigon is next year and the historic New Orleans collection is is having a major is is hosting a major exhibit on 50 years of Vietnamese American history in city in the city I'm also working on a, a bibliography for all the Chinese American histories and the Filipino American histories but what I really want to work on something that I was doing in graduate school but never finished was a historiography of all the Asian American histories and again I was mentioning the uh the Mississippi Delta Ethnographic Survey, which was one of the first attempts to do that, to write an actual history of Asian Americans in Louisiana. It's it, it's only only a few people have, have even tried this. Most of the people who've done Asian American history up up to recently were just working on just the Chinese or just the Filipinos or just the Japanese, including myself. But a lot has changed since uh, the pandemic and with the anti the anti AAPI. Hate, hate movement and it's really exciting we're we're living in this very exciting time where we're seeing this sort of a, this this movement this sort of growing sense of an of a shared asian american identity and that's translating into all these this new research in in, uh, in all these different communities and, and all these different communities working together to figure out each other's histories and that includes me because uh, originally i actually had no in because i'm a specialist in chinese history so originally, I didn't have any interest in other Asian American communities, but then uh, I came across stuff like the shrimp drying research, and I realized that, yeah, it's the Chinese, the Filipinos, and also the Japanese. They're all right next to each other. They're all working in the same industry. So this is one of many cases where there's actually a shared history between several groups of Asian Americans, and you really can't talk about one group without talking about the others. That's kind of what brought us together because yeah. you were researching Chinese history and you came across all these Filipinos and that's when you got in touch with me and you shared, yeah. you've been so generous in sharing your Filipino uh, research and, you know, that's that's wonderful that you do that. All of you, I got to say, um, historians are great people because anybody I've had asked questions of, they they were so generous with their sharing of their um, the research that they've done. So I really appreciate that. And you're nice. a busy man. I was at a family funeral and I decided to go out from the family <laughs> crypt to go visit other relatives in the um in the cemetery. And there's Winston with his notebook taking notes of all the people in the, the graveyard. So he's a very busy man. Thank you. Uh Ave Avellino is is asking that uh, what, that she's noticing that a lot of articles uh, and historians are refraining from the from using the word enslaved when talking about the Filipinos that were made to work on the galleons. Uh, and instead, they'll use words like subjects of the Spaniards. And so she wants to know, uh, why is this? And uh, and uh, why and weren't we technically and weren't the Filipinos technically enslaved since it was against their will? Um who wants to, Michael, do you want to take that one? Or? Uh, Ave, it's a great question, and it's something that I have um, I've dealt with and thought about um, um, quite a bit. Um, so there are there are um, essentially when when we're talking about Filipino sailors, the reason we don't use the term enslaved is because they're not um, they're not property, um, and so uh, I use I tend to use terms like um, folks who are unfree, uh, folks who are coerced. Um, but, um, you know, um, the, you know, ship owners do not claim um, sailors as um, property. Um, and so I think actually a key comparison to think about is the St. Malo uh, Maroons, right? So the, um, you know, in the 1700s, the, the St. Malo Maroons were Africans who were enslaved. Um, and because they were property, right, all of the, the Spaniards really worked really hard to go and um, chase them out of the swamps and go and get them and go and go and fight them. Um, when Filipinos leave the ships and they desert and they go to St. Malo, the ship owner, the, the people who run the ships go, eh, we'll just, we'll recruit somebody else, right? They, they, they kind of get left alone, right? Um, and so it is unfree. It is, it is coercion. Um, it, it's brutal and exploitative, right? Um, but it's, it's different than slavery. And so there's a, the, I, that's a distinction that I, um, that I that I try to make, and I agree uh, definitely because uh, we're going yeah uh, definitely when it comes to the Chinese plantation workers we have a a very similar situation. In fact, a, a lot of accounts of like Chinese railroad workers they'll say, oh, the Chinese are treated just like slaves. But to me, slavery is a word that we have to use very carefully. Uh, it's uh, definitely a, when it comes to I mean. 
no one else in this country is experiencing anything quite like chattel slavery that African Americans experience, except maybe Native Americans, uh, since they were actually mm -hmm. being uh, being uh, that that was definitely a genocide. Uh, but uh, no, it's like uh, the Chinese were treated brutally, as were uh, as were many of the European immigrants, like the Irish, for example. But whether it, whether it's appropriate to say that the Chinese were were enslaved on plantations, and I've heard people try to use that. Uh, to try to make that argument, I, I would very much oppose it. I, I mean, the Chinese were never in a situation where uh, they were stripped of their names and their identities and not allowed to speak their uh, speak their own language or speak their own uh, or practice their own religion. I mean, the Chinese were, uh, were did not experience the kind of brutalization that, Afri that enslaved Africans did, even though the Chinese were uh, contract workers and they could be sold. The Chinese did have their contracts sold, so the Chinese had basically no control over where they were working and they also had basically no uh, ability to renegotiate their contracts so definitely i think the chinese were experiencing a type of a coerced or unfree labor but i would stop short of saying enslaved the next question by mary garza garza is also for michael and you know she's reading that the same model was destroyed in 1915 whereas you're saying in 1893 in fact i think the historic marker even says 1915 so i'm wondering if you can talk about of where you're you're getting your dates from yeah so the um you know the accounts uh of the uh, newspaper accounts and writing around the 1893 shenye caminata hurricane um, indicate um you know that many of the people who lived at saint malo um perished and and um um many of the houses were destroyed during that hurricane i'm not sure where 1915 comes from um, it, it's certainly possible that, you know, there were some folks living living there after 1893, but I I usually um, cite that date because it's it was a date when there was known to be um, a lot of uh, where a lot of the houses were destroyed and a lot of folks um, passed away. Yeah, yeah and I've village, also seen. Go ahead. Go ahead Ron. Yeah, the village itself was destroyed, but um, some families um, the pylons were still standing for um, for a long time and. Families like um, the Pasquale family, uh, who my Aunt Joyce married a Pasquale, um, my uncle Romeo Pasquale's father, they went and built a camp on the stilts, on the um, pylons that was still standing. And several other people did the same thing. It was never a huge uh, village again, but there were camps here and there that uh, families would go to besides having their inland jobs they would take their families there to go fishing they had fishing uh shrimp boats and everything so it wasn't completely destroyed um by that hurricane as long as the pylons were there they were able to build on it but then i don't know which hurricane it might have been maybe betsy it just um took out whatever was left of it because my mom said that she remembers going to saint malo and of course she remembered going to manila village too when she was young but, um, and Camp Dewey. So, um, yeah, it, it did destroy the village, but it down here, so long as there are pylons, you can rebuild. Once the pylons are gone though, the, the, the wood that holds the, the camps up, then you can't rebuild. You can't put new pylons down. Yeah. And I've also seen a newspaper article from right after the 1893 hurricane and and they're at Shell Beach and the Philippine and it says that, yeah, a lot of the Filipinos living at Shell Beach used to live over at at, at St. Malo, which suggests that they can't live at St. Malo anymore. And that article is actually then is actually the Filipinos complaining about how they're not Malaysians. Everyone, everyone keeps calling them Malaysians, but the Filipinos are like, no, we're not Malaysians. We're, we're Catholic. We're, we're Spanish speaking. We're Filipinos. Yeah. So, yeah. And, so we've got another question from Michio and she's wondering uh, what impact the Spanish-American War had on the Filipinos and Chinese? Randy, would you like to answer that one? <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, there are some, I guess, the war for, for the communities, there was a, you know, after when the war was going on, there was a lot of people would come to, you know, Manila Village, right? They'd go down to Manila Village and to Barataria Bay and, and, and kind of to see the who uh, the Americans were fighting, right? It was kind of like, Let's see these Filipinos who the Americans are fighting. So there was that aspect of it. And the reportage kind of picked up. A, there's there's a lot more news about, you know, St. Malo and Manila Village and all at this time because of that. So we see that impact in the newspapers. 
But um, when you asked, there was so there would always they would ask you know Filipinos there, what do you think about the Spanish American, you know, the Spanish, and the answer was always Spanish bad kind of you know answer. So I mean, just on the in that sense, there was a sense of um, more media coverage around you know Manila Village. And that's where you see a lot of the conflation with St. Malo. They start talking about St. Malo, but they're really talking about Manila Village. They start telling stories that were told about St. Malo, but but they're they're putting them on top of Manila Village. So this idea of, you know, we have two kind of separate Filipino spaces there, and they're really, the media is unable to see the difference between St. Malo and Manila Village. But the impact, so that was the impact on the kind of media sense of, you know, how uh, how the war impacted the community. Just more people visiting them and asking questions. <laughs> yeah, well, I can say that we did have a, we had, of course, a, uh, we had families. We had a lot. First of all, the uh, Chinese, there was actually a Chinese uh, gentleman that served in the Spanish-American War, uh, uh, Ji Sung Young. Who settled in New Orleans right after the Spanish American War? Uh, we do also know the Hanadas did that. Uh, the the Tomematsu Hanada did that for probably first Japanese American uh, family founder of the first Japanese American family in New Orleans was a veteran of the Spanish American War. But the impact of the war on the Filipinos was profound because once the Philippines becomes part of the U.S., uh, basically Filipinos start coming into this country in large numbers. Uh, we have scholars, for example, uh, attending universities here. We also have agricultural workers, a lot of them in Hawaii and ultimately California, and ultimately the Filipino community in California uh, supersedes the one over here in Louisiana in the 20th century. Uh, so yeah, I mean, the and of course, when in those early couple of years, when the Philippines became an American territory, it was actually pretty easy. Uh, much easier for the Filipinos to come to this country than any other group of Asians, and uh, eventually the uh, eventually the natives put a stop to that by the 1930s. Uh, so America saw was was wondering about the name of that area, whether it was called Saint Malo before the Filipinos that were there. And Randy Gonzalez says yes, and in fact uh, the Saint Malo that we're referring to is is of course a is is of course the maroon leader. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, I don't know if Michael has anything to add to that, but yeah, I mean, there's a Bayou St. Malo out there. Uh, and uh, so I think the St. Malo, the, the settlement, I think, was probably named after the Bayou. And yeah, we think that probably the whole region was named after the, the historic person named St. Malo. So I don't know if Michael has anything to add to that. Yeah, I mean, one of the one of the best sources that we have about um, St. Malo is a, um, you know, in the eight, I believe it's the 1890s, there was a um, recorded um, um, folk song, you know, a um, kind of um, Afro Creole folk song that told the story of Juan Saint Malo, um, and and so we know that this was a story that was well known among people in Saint Bernard Parish, and people sort of knew um, that this this area was known as being the home of Saint Malo. Um, and I think interestingly, it, it it tells us that the the Filipino men who lived at this place called Saint Malo probably also knew this story, right? Because we know that people in Saint Bernard Parish would. Would share these stories, uh, particularly among, um, particularly among African Americans um, in the community. So, um, so yes, the the name Saint Malo. Pretty Mala. cool story. There was a slave uprising. It was pretty cool, you know. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I mean, and I think, uh, as I understand, Saint Malo is built on a shell mound, isn't it? So that that it was native, yes. built by Native Americans. So it's that's Native American midden. It's um, yeah. Like so that's trash pile. Yeah. Yeah, so that's an in intriguing thing to think about that 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 location has a site of historic significance to uh, Filipino and African American and Native American histories. So yeah, yeah. Uh, so uh, uh, Samuel Ramirez is asking about whether we actually have any records of Filipinos jumping ship from the Manila Acapulco galleons and ending up from Mexico to Louisiana, and that of course comes from Marina Espino's book. Filipinos in Louisiana. In fact, she very specifically says that the Filipinos were jumping ship in Mexico and making their way somehow from Mexico to Louisiana. And that is a question that I that I thought about writing in an whole article about what what the records would have looked like at that point in history. First of all, there's a growing body of research on enslaved Filipinos in Mexico. Uh, we have we we mentioned before about enslaved. Asians and yeah, I mean there were actual 
enslaved Asians, like like they were actually being bought and sold, and they in the Philippines, and they and some of them ended up in Mexico. Uh, there's the famous story of Ca Caterina San Juan, also known as, as uh, Chino Poblana, and she was actually a, an enslaved person from South Asia who ended up in the Philippines and ended up in Mexico. So yeah, I mean, there are researchers working on this and also working on the whole issue of erasure because basically the, the early Asian history of Mexico from the 1500s, they sort of melted into Indios, which was this generic word for indigenous. And they just sort of forgot that all these Asian people existed uh, back then. So they're working to recover that in the records. Uh, the problem with the Filipinos is that the word Filipino was was not used for people from the Philippines in the 1700s and well into the 1800s. Filipino in Spanish was almost like a word for criollo. So you had the peninsulares who, you, who are your Spanish people from Spain. And then you had the Filipinos who are basically white Spanish people who were born in the Philippines. And then beneath that, you have the mestizos who are mixtures between the Filipinos and the indios and indio. Beneath that, you have indios, which is indigenous Filipinos. You also had Singlais, who are mixtures of Filipinos and indigenous Filipinos and and Asians and uh, like from China and Japan. And then you had Chinos, which was a generic Spanish word for Oriental. So it could be Chinese or Japanese or South Asian. And then at the very bottom of this, this racial hierarchy, you had the Moros, which is a generic Spanish word for Muslim. Uh, Moros are not an ethnic group. It's just, just lots of different ethnic groups who happen to be Muslim. And so, yeah, it's not, I don't, the word Filipino doesn't become a universal word for everyone in the Philippines until the end of the 1800s. And in fact, that Filipino society tomb, the one that says Hispano-Filipino society tomb, the fact that that thing had been built in 1873 and uses the word Filipino, that's very intriguing. It's actually probably one of the earliest cases where the Filipinos are using the word as a word for all people from the Philippines. So it, it suggests that maybe this is an idea that, you know, this sort of Filipino nationalist idea maybe started out with overseas Filipinos and then made its way back uh, to the Philippines. But I mean, that's one of the reasons why it's hard to find records. I mean, I've looked at some of the Spanish records and they'll say like the when the Philippines, like that very first group of Filipinos that landed in California in the 1500s. They're called like Luzon, like Indios Luzon. So Luzon Indians. And it's very confusing because in the, the records it says, well, we sent the Luzon Indians and they found Indians. And so what they're saying is that their Filipino scouts had found these these indigenous Californians. But they're, they're, they call them all Indians because they're, they're all indigenous from the Spanish point of perspective. I don't know if anyone, that's why it's like, it's like you really have to look carefully if you, and I've tried looking in these Spanish records, Spanish records in the two years of high school Spanish that I, I have, which is enough Spanish to like go through the, 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 the catalog, but not enough to really understand the documents that I'm looking at. I don't know if anyone else has anything to add. I, I was going to say, was a, oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, Mexico go ahead. Rana. Was the, Mexico was the seat of government for the Philippines when uh, they were a Spanish colony so um i don't know maybe looking there, there might be records there i don't know Ancestry. well the records i was I well was, they're I was they're in gonna... seville they're in seville spain those are the those are, are all they? the records for all the colonies and a lot and some of them are online so yeah they're all in, oh, in spain wow. somebody who knows how to read spanish it, or in the 1700s right. the so first, um, the, oh i'm so sorry michael go ahead no well so what i was what i was just going to say to to samuel's question is you know, in terms of records of how they jumped, how they would have gotten from Mexico to Louisiana, the four people on this panel, we have collectively spent about a century, right, trying to find documentation of, documentation. of how, how exactly That's Filipinos right. got here. And it's been, it's, 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 it's really, it's really difficult. Um, mm -hmm. So, you know, I, I, you know, I, I went to Spain, I looked through some of those records, I, you know, I found some stuff and, and found, you know, records of, um, kind of Filipino sailors, um, you know, lots of Filipino sailors in the 1800s in um, in Cuba, and so there's a um, there's a you know my my one of my theories is that that there's kind of a Cuba New Orleans collection, um, but in terms of it, you know, it, it's one of the reasons why we we you know why the 1763 um, date is kind of um, you know it's been a you know point that we've talked about a lot over the years, right? Yes. Because we just don't have documentation right of people coming that early from um mexico so and one of the difficult things is that um like the first 
the very first document that I found on Felipe um, Madriaga was, I think, the 1860 census, and he was listed as Spanish. One of the problems is the Madriagas were not Madriagas. They were forced to take Spanish names. And a lot of my ancestors have Spanish surnames because of that. So it's hard to differentiate between the Spanish and the um, Filipinos unless you know who they are. And um, and unless they actually put on there that they were from the Philippine Islands, because the very first documentation I have was that census, and it said that he was from Spain, because the Philippines were part of Spain back then. So um, it's really confusing. It that's made it very difficult. And I know that there are a lot of Filipinos in Mexico. I've met some of them when I lived in Arizona. Um, they trace their ancestry back to. Filipinos who were in the galleon trade and they still kept that that history you know the, that verbal history and that's really all we have is oral history um we don't have anything concrete that that can put us here in the 1700s unfortunately yeah, I mean yeah I mean Filipino the word Filipino is just not a word that you expect to see in records in the 1700s unless again they're talking right. about actual Spanish people from the Philippines and you even saw in my presentation that even in the 1900 census they're not identified as natives of the Philippines they're identified mm -hmm. as natives of Manila we know not all those people were from Manila although right. I will say that in the past before they adopted this universal word Filipino Filipinos identified themselves by maybe what 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 uh, the, what township they were from, or what language they would have spoken, or what or what yeah, island? Yeah, tribal names. So, I mean, yeah, or, tribal, yeah, or names tribal names. names. So, yeah. yeah, exactly. So, well, does everyone, anyone? Um, yeah. Thank, thank you guys. Yeah. Thank all the panelists. I mean, the <laughs> discussion's gone yeah. well over. Yeah, well uh, over. Frame yeah. Because everyone was so engaging, but uh, Winston, you did a wonderful job. Everyone did yes. uh, marvelous with their presentations. If the commenters or the participants, uh, the, the people tuning in have any other specific questions, I think you can reach everyone via their home institutions or Rhonda through her Facebook uh, page. Uh, also, the LHA meeting, I want to uh, make a plug for that. That's in person next week in New Orleans. Uh, you can visit the LHA homepage for more information. And uh, I'm going to go ahead and stop the recording now. And um, thank everyone for tuning in. Thank you. Thank you. Thank